Now that SCOM is finally installed, we're ready to start monitoring things. Well, almost, because there are a few things that I like to do before I think of the SCOM platform to be production ready. So some of the settings I'll discuss in this video, you might choose to leave as they are, and that's fine. Others, you'll definitely want to change. So let's start here on our SQL Server, as there are a few things that I want to sort out. Now, firstly, when we installed our databases for use with SCOM, we accepted the default values, which created really small database sizes of about one gig. Now, back when we were talking about using the sizing calculator, now it's time to put in some more acceptable values and then grow our databases to what we'll need, or at least something that we think we're going to need. But obviously, we can change it later if need be. So on our SQL Server, we're going to open up the Management Studio. And we'll connect. And over on the left here, we'll expand our databases. And we're going to right click on our Operations Manager database and choose Properties. Now we'll choose Files. And we're going to change our data and logs to reflect something a little bit more acceptable for our environment. Again, whatever values you change this to should reflect what you think your database will grow to based on how many agents you're going to support and how long you might need to keep the data. So I'm going to change mine to 10,000 and I'll set the logs to 5,000. And I'm going to leave auto growth off and click OK. All right, that's done. That was pretty quick. Now we'll do the same thing for our data warehouse. So we're going to right click on that one, properties, files, and I'm going to set this one a little higher since I'm dealing with a data warehouse here, where I'll obviously want to store more data for longer periods. So I'm going to set mine to 20,000 and 10,000. And auto growth is on for this one, which is fine. So let's click OK there. OK, well, the next thing I like to do is set the amount of memory that SQL will use. Now, this server only has 8 gig of memory in it, not too much for a SQL server, but that's OK. Again, it's just a lab. So my preference is to leave around 2 gig of memory for Windows itself. So we'll go and right click on our SQL server and choose properties. And then we'll choose memory. And right here, I'm going to set this to 6,000. Now, under database settings, I like to choose compress backup. And the next thing I want to do is configure the max degree of parallelism. Now, what is that? Well, when SQL Server runs on a server that's got more than one processor, it will automatically try and find the best level of parallelism by itself. Now, this parallelism is simply the number of processes that SQL uses to run a single statement for each query that has a parallel execution plan. Now, with a default SQL Server configuration, SQL Server itself will determine the level of parallelism to use. However, on servers using hyper-threading technology, which is pretty much everything these days, this usually doesn't end up working out right. And that's simply because SQL Server thinks there are more CPUs present in your server than there actually are. So in cases like these, it's better that you set this value by yourself. So for instance, by using this max.calculator. calculator. Otherwise, SQL Server will use all the available processes it thinks it has other than what you really have. And this can result in really bad performance. So this website's pretty simple. It wants us to run this query and run this uh, little bit of PowerShell here on our SQL Server. So obviously, we're going to do both. So let's go back to our SQL Management Studio. And we'll just click OK here to apply the other changes that we had made. And we'll open up a new query. And we're going to paste in that query and we'll run that. All right, now the first value that comes back is 1. So we know that this value in here is going to be 1, so we'll set that to 1. And the final thing we had to do was then obviously run the PowerShell. So let's do that. So we're going to look for the number of cores in this machine, and that comes back with 4. So in the second field, we'll enter in 4. And now that'll populate the maximum degree of parallelism that we should be setting in SQL Server, and obviously it comes back with 4. 
Cool, okay, so we'll go back to our database server and we'll right click on our server and we'll choose properties. And then we'll choose advanced. And right down near the bottom, you can see we've got our max degree of parallelism right there, currently set to zero. So we'll set ours to four and we'll click OK. And all of those changes will be applied. All right, cool. Well, that's the initial changes I like to make with SQL. Again, not all of those are entirely necessary, but those are my personal preferences. All right, well, I've just switched over to one of my management servers because we want to make a few changes here and be aware of a few settings that we also might like to change. Firstly, setting our service principal names for our DAS accounts. Now, I'm not going to bore you with a lengthy explanation about why we do this, but instead I'm going to point you to this page where I've provided, obviously, a lengthy blog post about it. So what we're just going to do is we're going to open up a command prompt. And for this, we will need domain admin privileges. Now I'm also going to open up Windows Explorer and navigate to my software scripts folder because I've already pre-prepared the commands to run under set service principal names. So that way we can just simply copy and paste them in. And I've got some comments in here which are rather self-explanatory. So what we're going to do is we're going to set our SPN for our first SCOM management server. So let's paste that in. And by the way, if you do see that you've got a duplicate SPN found, then that's okay, it's already been created for you. But let's paste in the second one. And finally, we're going to do it for our SQL Service account because we're using a service account for SQL Server. Okay, all right, that was easy enough. Now, let's load up the Operations Manager console. And let's go to Administration. And then choose Settings because there's probably a few things you might want to change in here. Now, the first is the Agent Heartbeat Interval, which, as you can see, defaults to 60 seconds. Now, some people like to make this a little higher. I guess it really depends on how reliable your environment is, but every 60 seconds by default, this agent is going to check in with its assigned management server. However, let's cancel this and open up the heartbeat for the server, as obviously that one was for an agent. So in this window, you can see that when an agent does stop responding, the management server can ping the agent to see if it responds. And it will also allow three missed heartbeats. So the agent will heartbeat every 60 seconds, or one minute if you like, and the management server will allow three missed heartbeats before pinging it. So one minute times three minutes is three minutes, right? No, wrong. Actually, this window allows three failures. So it actually is on the fourth failed agent heartbeat that SCOM will raise a heartbeat failure alert, and then it will attempt to ping the agent. Now, if that ping also fails, SCOM will then raise a failed to connect computer alert as well, but only at the fourth failure. This wording is very important. We will allow three failures. All right, now, something else you most likely will want to change, and it's something that I definitely will do, will be found under security, and that's to change this setting to reject new manual agent installations, instead to review them in pending management, which you'll see over here. Now, the reason I like to make this change is because it's quite likely that you'll be installing many agents from maybe a script or maybe deploying them using SCCM or some other tool or running an agent installation manually on, say, a server in a DMZ. So we don't want to reject these installations outright, but configure them to be reviewed by an administrator and then we can decide if that agent should be allowed to connect to our management group. Now, most of the other things here I generally don't change, but depending on your company's needs, you might want to look at the database grooming intervals and review those. Oh, and remember that when we installed SCOM, the default behavior is to send data to Microsoft. So if we open up privacy, you can see we can turn that off right here. And since this is a lab, I'm going to do just that. Right now, one final thing we haven't yet done is to configure our SCOM license key. So to do that, we'll open up uh, operations manager shell and then we would type in set scom license followed by our license key which obviously i'm not going to type in my license key here for the world to see now after we do this we will need to reboot our server uh, so that it takes effect and if we go to our monitoring tab and at the top here select monitoring 
you can see that one of our tasks here, and we did briefly speak about it in an earlier video, is to license our installation of SCOM. Now failure to do so will result in SCOM stopping working one day, so it's a pretty good idea to do it immediately and get it out of the way to avoid any headaches later on. So these were some of the post-installation tasks that I like to do when I install a new SCOM environment. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I'd like to thank you for watching.